we're going to go ahead and start with the first question. Um, this is a question and a picture that was submitted by one of our participants tonight. Um, they did send in a picture and if you look, you can see some little bugs on there. So their question is, what are these pests and how do I get rid of them? And this is what we think they are. Um, and Larry and Leslie, you're here. Do you want to talk about um, aphids at all? Yeah, just a couple of interesting things. The aphids are extremely small. So you, <laughs> if it was me going out there looking for them, I'd put my reading glasses on. Um, and they, <laughs> they um, grow fairly rapidly, although they do not get of any size. Um, but the point is, is they'll, they'll leave a, like a, an exoskeleton that's kind of whitish. Uh, you know, behind them, and it sometimes will stick to the surface um, of the leaf. So that's something else that you can look for. And the insecticidal slope, which is uh, really non-toxic, it's not a, it's not a heavy, yeah. heavy uh, herbicide, if you will. Um, you can buy it in, in a lot of different big boxes in nurseries around town, fairly inexpensive, and it comes in a, usually a hand spray bottle that works pretty well for controlling these. But you can also just get the hose out and just kind of lightly hose them down and then check the next day to see if they come back. Uh, the other my, thing is, is if you if you have some um, lady lady beetles, lady beetles, yes, as we normally call them, they're great um, eaters of of, uh, of aphids. So. Yeah, so wel welcome them in your garden. Yeah. Okay, and if you have any further questions about aphids, you can go ahead and put those in the chat box. And when we get to the midpoint, we will um, try to go back and talk some more about aphids. I see Carla made it in. Hi, Carla. I'm going to unmute you. Can't unmute you. She can unmute there you are. Am I here? Am I? Am I? You're here. You're here. Oh, audible. <laughs> Good. Yeah. All right. I am You're... going to attempt to lift up this so I can get a better. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, well, we we just finished question one, and we were talking about aphids, and uh, Le Larry and Leslie were talking about different ways to handle aphids. Um, so we're ready to go on to the next question, I believe. Okay. So question two, um, this was another one that was submitted by one of our participants. It's a picture of their hosta and they are wondering what is eating this slugs. hosta. Yes. Um, slugs. This is what we think. Um, so this is an answer that we had come up with. If anybody has any other, Carla or Larry or Leslie, anything else to say about this? Yeah. I am having wonderful success with beer. Mm -hmm. Take a, uh, like a tuna fish can or, you know, a, a small can and, you know, fill it with beer and set them around your hostas underneath and they will happily, they're alcoholics, they will drown <laughs> in it. I caught Carl, two that way yesterday. <laughs> Carl, one thing I read about, we've used that approach before, always use the most inexpensive beer. But yeah. if yes. you're not a beer drinker, um, another alternative, small little dish, just put some uh, tap water in there and mix in a little baking yeast. Oh, I've tried that and I've used for had baking? success with that because okay. I thought, okay, you know, maybe it's the yeast that they're really liking, but yeah. now that didn't seem to work very well. So, so you, do you set the beer in the dirt or on the yeah. ground around the pot? Um, put the, <laughs> uh, the tin can full of beer uh, on the ground. Uh, if you've got a potted hosta, you can just put it, you know, on the ground and they'll crawl into it and okay. just happily drown. <laughs> Barbara, I had them around my strawberries and yeah. I actually yeah. pushed some of the dirt aside and put the can yeah. down to ground level. Yeah. Um, okay. And um, I caught overnight, I caught, they, cause they, they come out at night. Overnight I caught two, two okay. giant slugs in there. I was so happy I took a picture and put it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we found it works better to to uh, 
like you did, Deb, dig a hole in there and kind of get it right at surface level so they can just crawl up to it and fall in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most of my pots are on my driveway, so mm -hmm. I don't have the option of yeah. digging them in, but I have pretty good success even, mm -hmm. even so. They, they'll crawl in. Okay. Okay, are we ready to go on to the next question? Yeah. Okay, um, question three. I don't have a picture with this one. This is another one that was submitted by one of our participants. Um, they were having a problem. They're planting red bell peppers um, that, you know, the package that they plant, the seeds say that they're red, um, but they stay green for a long time and then when before they turn red, they start rotting. Um, so they wanna know what can they do to get red bell peppers? And Larry, I believe this was your answer. It is, but I do have a question uh, first, Deb. Do you know a lady that, I think it was a lady that took this in, is she logged on with us? I'm not sure who it was um, okay. because we didn't attach well, it. It was um, Charlie and Joan Kellis. We asked the question. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I have, a, I have a further question. Red peppers, not every green bell pepper that you buy, a variety, will turn into a, to a red one, but the more will at some point. It will reduce the amount of, of a yield on your plant because the plant, uh, once you cut up a, 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 what you think is a, a ripe a pepper off of the plant, it'll start trying to grow another one. But if you leave them on there longer, then of course it's gonna say, okay, I'm not gonna grow as many. And then that, that red pepper won't last as long as a green pepper will because it's, it's really, really ripe. Um, so my question uh, to the folks that sent this in is, where on the pepper was the rot uh, notice? And was it a shade of brown? Just wanna confirm that. Was it a brown color? Yeah, yeah, on the interior, inside. It was um, on the inside, it was brown, and then it starts oh. looking oh. like it's a hole coming through. And you, you didn't, it wasn't on the exterior of the, of the pepper at all? No, the, the exterior looked pretty good, and, but when I went to, uh, you know, clean it up to, to uh, prepare it to eat, when I cut it open, I noticed uh, what looked like just a deterioration and browning on the inside. Okay. It, was it red when you cut it off? It was a combination. I never have gotten a really solid red pepper, the kind you see in the supermarkets. Okay. And, and you've been growing these peppers in the same location? Um, yeah, pretty much because I have a small little patch okay. in the backyard. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, basically in the same place. One of the thing, one of the things peppers need. Uh, other plants are like this too. Tomatoes, for example, um, they they suck quite a bit of calcium out of the out of the soil. Okay. Uh, for most vegetables, what you want to do, if you're able to do it given the space you have, is rotate your crops. So, for example, never plant your tomatoes the same place year after year. Never okay. plant, plant never uh, almost any of your of your uh, plants. Rotation. Now, some of them, for example, like your berries, strawberries, they're kind of fixed. They're gonna stay there for a couple of years and that's, that's kind of an exception. But so for these peppers, if you haven't done a, a soil test, and I wanna consider doing a soil test, um, but it sounds like you need some uh, calcium mm -hmm. put back into the soil. One way to do that is um, uh, a product called, um, um, no, slip my... bone yeah, bone meal. Bone That's meal. it. Thank you. Hold it. I want to get it's bone pen. meal. It's a powdered. Uh, you can buy it at any big box. It's not very expensive, and it goes a long way. You don't sure. need it. Tomatoes. This is a good way of putting calcium back in the soil. Eggshells also work, but eggshells take a lot longer to decompose. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. You want to you want to kind of turn it in to the top of the soil and then water it down a little bit. This is something you would do couple of months before you'd even plant the, the pepper. So you may right. be dealing with, with a, uh, a calcium or 
um, and or you may have a problem with, wa with watering. Peppers on average need two to three inches of rain a week, but not all at once. Okay. Okay. So if you're, if you're overwatering or underwatering from that, then that's going to cause some rot, rot and it'll show up fairly quickly, yeah. usually before the, the, uh, the pe pepper is actually ready to be harvested. Right. Okay. Very good. I'll give her a shot. Okay. Good. All right. Thank, good you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go on to question number four. This one actually just came in this morning. Um, and this is someone to hey. the picture in of collards. Excuse me. I, I, yeah. I, I didn't realize I was on mute. Um, could you please spell the name of that calcium product again? Oh, it's a um, bone. bone. It's two words, bone, B-O-N-E. Oh, bone meal? Yeah, yeah. bone oh, meal. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. hear Okay. It's in a powdery, comes in a couple of pound bag most of the time. Okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't know what bone meal is. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. okay. Okay, so this picture just came in this morning, so we didn't really have a chance to get everybody to look at it. So um, Carla and Larry and Leslie, if you want to take a look at this now, um, they want to know, this is the coll uh, collards that they got and something, I think it's, it looks like a little insect here um, mm -hmm. might be on it. Mm -hmm. um, any ideas? The uh, holes kind of look like slugs, but I'm wondering, it looks oh, almost like uh, bubbles true. on the uh, upper yeah, those yeah, that white. part of the leaf. That upper part? Like the, the right. Hmm. Yeah, the upper part is, yes, I, I sprayed it with insecticide, but that's a little insect right there. Huh, okay. Okay, so this is just, the, oops, I'm sorry. Insecticidal okay. soap, I should say. Yeah. So, so, so that, there's a little um, insect you can see, right? Um, is it a, is it like a little white caterpillar? It looks yeah, like it's it. white. Yeah. Okay. You think it's a caterpillar? Well, it's hard to tell from here. But yeah. Given that it's got you know some length and these kind of skinny looking, it it could be. There are there are a lot of good chewers that, that love vegetable gardens that are of that coloration. Um, and particularly when you see them on the bottom side of the leaf, yeah, yeah. they tend could, to be underneath rather than on top. Okay. Larry, could it be a cabbage worm? I know they t attack the coal crops. Oh, oh, that's a most of the cabbage worms I've seen, we haven't grown cabbage for a couple of years now, but most of the cabbage I've seen, um, that, that we were lucky enough to get them, uh, they ruined all our cabbage. They were, <laughs> they're, they're green. They're, the ones yeah, we green. Have, oh, okay. Green. Yeah. Uh, and a little little yeah. thicker than this one appears to be. I've never grown forward, so but but this guy's pretty um if it is a, a caterpillar, he's he's pretty active because he's chewed up a pretty good part of that. And I would suggest verifying if you need a micro uh, magnifying glass or something to, to verify that is whoever the person is that sent this in. If it is a crawler, um what do you think, Carl? If you'll begin with yeah, it, it definitely looks like some kind of a caterpillar to me, and uh, they would be responsible for those big, you know, swaths of, of holes. Um, kind of like a, a, a cabbage caterpillar, because I know they can defoliate a cabbage oh, yeah. leaf mm -hmm. by the time you blink. And I'd be looking for some uh, egg, egg uh Egg masses. masses. I wonder if that leaves. might be what some of those bubbly things are. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I would recommend because I don't. I don't know, Leslie and Larry. You you know a lot more about vegetables than I do, but you don't really want to spray your vegetables, do you? Well, so that's well, the problem. Like hand picking. Insecticidal is okay. Okay. And neem neem oil is okay. Yeah. 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 But anything, even even insecticidal, I wouldn't spray it today and eat it tomorrow. No, right, right. Can I jump in on this? Yep. Yes, hey. please. I, <laughs> I enlarged this picture and I'm looking with a magnifying glass and it looks like it is, it's not a caterpillar. It's more okay. like an egg casing that's got a sort of ah. webbing around it. Okay. With, you know, it's got something around it to protect it. Okay. So I'd say that's more of an egg case. 
So it's an egg casing, but there's a there's a caterpillar someplace in the area. It has been there, yes. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure what the egg casing is though. Hmm. It's definitely I, no I just want to emphasize if you do decide if if you do decide to use an insecticidal soap or um, a neem oil, just make sure you read the label because a lot of times they'll have the withdrawal time with how long you need to wait yeah. before you eat it on there. So just make sure you check your label. Right. Ne neem oil is very short time for vegetables. Mm. In fact, the poison, the poison control, I had someone who used neem oil and she had a sandwich when she was spraying. She had a sandwich that was on the counter where she was spraying and she said her sandwich got a good dose of it. So Ooh. she called the poison center, and they said that you could, you can actually use it as flavoring. Neem <laughs> wanted to. So oh, like I don't know, but definitely wouldn't definitely wouldn't recommend that. Well, <laughs> definitely wouldn't recommend uh, neem oil as flavoring. Well, they may, it is a natural thing, and they do use it in like soaps and things like yeah. that. So it can go on your skin, even. I mean, if you have bugs crawling on you. We I guess. Had a, they were just making the point. We had a question safe. in the chat box about what is what is neem oil? It's N E E M. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. There you go, neem oil. And they don't have it at Lowe's at the moment. They're sold out, but you can get it from Amazon. But it comes from a neem tree. It's an actual, an actual natural product that comes yes. straight out of a tree. So it's not a chemical, um, man made chemical type thing. So I'm reading the insecticidal soap mm -hmm. and it says may be applied to edibles up to day of harvest. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, it doesn't have a long time either. Okay. Yeah, I always rinse everything off anyway, so. I do too, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you should be safe. <laughs> but the, the neem oil, the way it works is it, it's, the reason I love neem oil is because it only, um, unless you spray it directly on a bee or something, it won't harm bees or butterflies because it harms the insects that actually ingest it. So if you spray it on a plant that's being eaten, the only thing it's gonna hurt are the insects that are eating that plant. So that's what I love about it because I don't wanna hurt bees or butterflies. So I make sure if I need to spray it, that they're not around. Yeah. It, it back, it, and back to, uh, to Wendy's comment uh, regarding, she thinks that's a uh, basically an egg sac. Uh, in that yeah, way. Let me go back. I'm sorry, I advanced this. Oops. Um, spraying that with insecticidal soap or neem is probably not going to do anything. You need to take that leaf off and destroy it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So any egg sac you see, if it looks like that, like sometimes you'll see little uh, clusters of eggs, really small eggs, like a caterpillar. Colorado yeah. potato beetle, for example, it looks like bugs. a bunch of, of uh, um, um, little, little tennis balls, little puny <laughs> tennis balls. Yeah. But this one is in a is in a protective sack, so it's going to be yeah. even harder for for the uh, any spray to affect that. We need to take them off. Okay, yeah. just, just remove yeah. it, yeah. destroy yeah. it. Don't Can put I it in your compost. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, Cabbage worms absolutely destroy my kale. Mm -hmm. uh, will mm -hmm. neem oil help uh, guard against them? Should or do. against the bu yeah. butterflies, moths that the cabbage moths that plant their eggs on my kale and that then turn into the caterpillars that eat it? Yeah. Yeah, yes. the the little white caterpillar, the little white tech, um, the little white butterflies that yeah. they're the ones that lay the eggs that that, that grow the little green caterpillars that eat your kale. Yep. Yeah, it's a yeah. cabbage white. It's yep. called a cabbage white. Well, uh, but but the uh, the the caterpillars are green. Right. Yeah, but yeah. do uh, will the neem oil help? Is my question. Yes, it's an insecticide, so it should help against anything. Like, is it an insecticide? an herbicide, and a pesticide. Mm -hmm. So that should should cover all three. I actually, I just, I just checked on uh, University of Maryland Extension's website, and yes, neem oil can be used um, for cabbage worms. Well, uh, does it protect from the egg sacs actually being laid on the leaf, or does it just protect against when they eat it? 
I would think that it would do in the caterpillars themselves. Yeah. Not, not the eggs, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, Claire, if you have a big infestation um, of things like kale or, or anything in that family, uh, you might want to consider putting, uh, it's a, a very lightweight white, kind we use, is a, it's a screen. It, it lets in 90% of the, of the uh, UV light that, that the plants need but it keeps white uh, keeps butterflies oh. and others out of there. You have to have a really tight seal around it all the way to the ground, but the yeah. plant will grow underneath it and, and the less chance of the eggs being laid. You could use floating row cover too, couldn't you? All right, floating Good. row cover. Yeah. That, would, that would work too, because it lets the rain in, lets the sun yes. in. Yeah, the stuff we use to hit, it let rain in too. Okay. Well, Number five. Thank you. We're going to go on to the next question. Um, this person submitted a question. The person who submitted this question said she couldn't be here tonight, but I thought it was an interesting question. So it's here anyway. Um, she has a native honeysuckle plant that's three years old. Um, it's getting enough sun, but it's um, not blooming for her. So she wants to just dig it up and throw it away, which I don't want her to dig up or her native honeysuckle and throw it away. So we're trying to help her figure this out. So we have a couple of ideas here. Um, I think Carla, you were the one who was talking about this. Right, uh, about, uh, they don't, they probably don't need a whole lot of fertilizer. And if a plant gets too much nitrogen, it'll put out a lot of leaves and not bother about blooming. That's true. Mm -hmm. And native plants are not supposed to be fed anyway. Not yeah, they're, they're pretty tough. <laughs> and could be, she's overfeeding. She might be doing it miracle grow or something. Yeah, she actually got back to me and said that she was not feeding it. Um, so the only other solution I could find when I did a little research was that um, that it blooms on new growth. And if she's pruned that off, because she did say it was very getting very large and she was trying to control it. <laughs> And if she had cut off the new growth, that might be why she's not getting the, the blooms in the spring. Right, so oh, she that needs- That might be the answer right there, yeah. yeah. If she needs to trim it, because it's growing so quickly, she needs to trim it as soon as it's finished blooming. Right. Not later. Okay. That might solve her problem. So the next question, um, Carla, I believe you addressed this one too. Uh, right. Someone has been trying for years to get grass to grow under her trees. She says it's not too much shade, but I mean, trees do produce shade. Um, so uh, Carla, this was your suggestion, if you wanna talk about it. Yeah, um, I have a neighbor with the same problem. He's forever trying to get grass to grow where there's a few trees and he just has no no success with it. Uh, there are some shade tolerant grasses, but you know, if she's tried that and still nothing, I would say, you know, give up the grass idea and try ground cover. There's a lot of really nice ground covers that will grow in the shade very happily. Uh, or if she wants to try something else, she can try containers, which would look really nice also. Containers with uh, shade lovers in, in them. Okay, anybody else have anything to add? Larry, yeah. Wendy? Just a comment that grass and, grass and trees- oh, are the, One thing I was- They don't get along with each other. Not usually. <laughs> so, yeah, and one thing I was thinking, how, uh, um, you know, with her tree, you know, what, what the, what's the variety of tree for one? And, you know, how limbed up is it? Is there enough, you know, area to get some, some air in there and some sun from underneath of the, the tree? So those are my questions. Like how, what kind of tree it, it is, is also important to what to plant underneath yeah, it. Yeah, because if it's a black walnut tree, nothing will grow underneath. Exactly. Not, <laughs> not ground covers, not anything else, because a black walnut and sunflower seeds also, give off a chemical that will prevent anything from growing underneath them. Yeah. I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but it's spelled J-U-G-L-O-N-E. Yeah, juglins. And as far as I know, I think, I think the limbing up, uh, if she's able to, if, if there are some fairly low limbs, 
that might help her. Yeah, she could also grow hostas around the tree, around the base of the tree. Mm. Yeah. They do well in shade. Mm -hmm. Just uh, coral bells. Coral bells, Euchara. Yep, Euchara's. Um, Pacara aria, also known as Juga. golden ragwort. A juga. Right. There's all kinds of uh, shade lovers that will grow very successfully under a tree. And Megan, back to you just for a second, if I can make an editorial comment. Um, you're reminding us, uh, and, and for the benefit of everybody, when you send in a question or you call us at the help desk, we'd like to know what kind of tree, if at all possible, if, if you think you know, yeah. if you, if, or if you know for sure. And if you don't, we can, we, uh, if you bring a sample in when we get back to the new normal, <laughs> um, we'll tell you whether it's okay if it's a black walnut like Wendy mentioned then there's the, there's a reason right there yeah so if more information you can give us the better Debbie Great I point, think Larry. you have Great lost point. my visual can you still hear me yes yeah. oh good <laughs> okay we're going to go on to the next question um, we have a, a series of questions together here that have to do with watering and um, this one is about new plants. Um, someone asked, how long does it usually take for newer plants um, to establish their roots and need less water? And I believe, Wendy, you wanted to talk about this. Yeah, because very often when you, when you buy new plants or shrubs, when you take them out of the pot, the roots go around in a circle. And if you look at the bottom, it's just a mess and tangle of roots. That all has to be what they call tickled. You've got to pull it out with your fingers or else use a small hand rake and just loosen up those roots at the bottom there. And then I usually cut them like north, south, east and west on the pot down the sides. And that, it breaks the root system that's going round in a circle and it will then produce new roots. It will encourage the plant to produce new roots, which it will do within two weeks. It will start growing quite quickly. If you don't do this, if you don't tickle the roots and cut them down the sides, then they will keep growing in the size and shape of the pot and it will never change. They'll never break out of that shape, which is a shame because then your plant will not thrive. And you wanted to talk about watering? Well, what, yes, you have to water deeply mm -hmm. uh, in order to keep the roots from growing towards the surface, especially with, this especially with grass, not so much with plants, but with grass, um, grass will head towards the nearest moisture so if you give half an inch of water on your lawn and do it every day then the roots on the grass are going to grow up towards that moisture and it's going to give them very shallow roots and your grass is going to get stressed when it gets really really hot and it, it really goes for plants also too they need good deep watering to encourage the roots to go down because they are the anchor for your plants they need good roots Okay, and we have more questions along that vein. Um, so this is, she just talked a little bit about lawns um, and Steve, I don't know if Steve made it in here, um, but uh, there was someone- Steve, Steve didn't make it in, oh. They okay. had, they, I think they had a power outage. Oh no, yeah, those things happen. Um, yep. But uh, I'm sure there's somebody else that can talk about lawns here. Um, he did, um, get back to me and with the answer to this, um, but he also had a he also had this little system of how he would determine um, how much water was coming out of say your your sprinkler system. So he said to put like three cans, like one in the middle and one at each end of where your uh, water was coming out, and then time it and see with your water running and see how long it took to get half an inch in that can. And that's how long you should run your water. So that was his recommendation. Um, anybody else want to talk about uh, lawn watering? Well, one of the things that Steve mentioned, um, and we've talked about before as a group, Master Gardeners, is um, watering, the time of day you water is, is mm -hmm. important, especially yeah. if you're talking about grasses. But it also applies um, to, to most plants. Um, Grass, you don't have to worry about the leaf problem with a, a larger shrub. You want to keep the water off of a shrub, the, the leaf, if, if at all possible, get it down on, at, at the roots and water it well, water it deep like Wendy said. Um, but also water earlier in the day 
not during the hot sun and not, I talked to a friend of mine that was watering just before sunset because he figured the, the, the water, the soil would be moist longer. Trouble is, is he was watering with, with an impact sprinkler that was sprinkling it all over his, the leaves of all of his shrubs too. And he was getting burn spots. Hmm. Um, so. Early, yeah, it will, it will scorch yeah. your leaves. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Wendy. It will scorch your leaves. Yep, yeah. scorch the leaves. Yeah. Um, particularly noticeable on plants like uh, Japanese maple. Um, Steve also mentioned uh, fescue, which is the dominant um, lawn grass in the mid-Atlantic, yeah. which is a cool crop grass and should not be fertilized in the spring um, as a rule, but should be watered at least an inch over the course of one week. Yeah. Now, if you have an automatic sprinkler system, most sprinkler heads will put out about two gallons a minute. That may not, if you only leave that on for 10 minutes, that's not gonna give you a whole lot of water. So I like Steve's idea of getting the tuna cans and putting them out there in the lawn and then trying it, whether you're using a portable sprinkler or if you have a fixed system to see how much water you're really getting in the soil. And yeah. Another way you can check that is to actually spade open uh, a, uh, maybe a six by six inch section of your, of your lawn, cut down about six inches and after you've watered, maybe wait an hour or so, pull it back up and see how far that, that water really percolated down into the soil. I know where we are, a lot of, a lot of us have uh, sandy clay soil. That stuff, if it's dry and all of a sudden you water it for a half hour, um, the top will get so it won't right, get down very far. That's good shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I have, a, I have a, um, a question that came in in the chat box. Mm -hmm. um, someone wants to know um, how often should she water her tomato plants? She has it growing on a deck. Um, with basil in the same container. And then there was also a question about what do you mean by deep watering? How long and how often? I would say on the, uh, the tomato plant growing on the deck, um, in the hot weather, sometimes you may have to water up to two times a day. Uh, the best thing you can do is stick your finger in the soil and uh, see how moist it is. If you can go down about an inch, half an inch to an inch, and it's dry, you definitely need to water at that point. Yeah. Cut. Container plants will definitely need more water than a plant that's in the, in the soil almost 100% of the time. Um, I would ask the, the person that, that sent the chat in, um, is the, are the containers she's using, do they have trays in the bottom yeah, of them they, they or are they draining out and then therefore a lot of the water is going off the deck somehow? Um, so, you know. It's the, um, the cloth, um, it's that cloth type container. Grow bags? Yeah. Grow, ba grow bags? Mm. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Tomatoes, there's no, I've not read anything in recent years anyway about exact amounts um, every day or every week for tomato plants. The, ma the main thing about tomato plants is they want consistent watering. They don't like wet feet like most plants, but they don't like the soil. You know, you, you water it well one day and five days later you water it again. You're going to end up with bottom end rot more yeah. than not yeah. in tomatoes if that happens. Um, so they, they'd like, they need the consistency. A little water most days, uh, taking into account the rain that you get, uh, the better off you're going to be. Actually, that, that's important too when you're growing in pots because pots yep. dry out, as you say, dry out very quickly. Yep. And the thing is, if that soil gets super, super dry, it doesn't matter how much, how much water you pour in that, in that flower pot, the water is just going to run through and it's not going right to wet through. the soil. Yeah. Now, if that happens, that your soil gets super dry and doesn't absorb the water, if you put just a few drops of uh, dishwashing liquid in the water, it will cause that water to go into the soil and not just run through. Yeah, it slows it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. So that, you know, that it, it makes it uh, stick to the soil rather than just run through it. Now, there's another way that you can test to see how, much, how wet your soil is in a flower pot. If you use a drinking straw, put it down the side of the pot and then put um, 
a pipe cleaner down inside it. And when you water, when you finish watering, give it a few minutes to soak, and, and then you pull out the pipe cleaner and see how, for how many inches have got wet in the pipe cleaner. That's good. It's really good. It's good for house plants. It's good for things that you have on your deck if you're not sure if they're getting enough water. Because not, as you say, it's not good to leave things sitting in a saucer full of water. One of the uh, garden tools that Leslie and I invested in years ago, very pretty inexpensive. It's a two prong. It's about um, probably eight or ten inches long, and it's it's a water. It's a moisture meter. Yeah, I have those too. We use it for our house plants, and we use it out in the garden. And you just stick. Yeah thing down there and, until you can just see the meter on the top and it's pretty accurate it'll tell you whether it's stone dry or, or really wet yeah it's, it's really good and sometimes one side of your pot will be moist and the other side will be dry yeah so you know where to water them <laughs> i just so. wanted to mention a couple other things too that steve um said about lawns um he also told me that uh you have to worry about um, evaporation and mm -hmm. you may be watering your lawn and a lot of it is just escaping into the air just drying out when the air is dry so your wa lawn will get more water if you um, water it when it's humid um, but he also said that um, and that's and he said that's usually the most humid time of day is around sunrise yep. um, and then he said you should never put your lawn to bed wet so don't water it late without giving it a chance to dry out before the nighttime um, because that can encourage uh, fungus to grow in your lawn and you don't want that to happen. You'll get all those little brown spots. Yeah. So those were a couple other things that he had to say about watering. Okay, we ready to move on? I think the next question is about watering also. Um, yes, Larry, you were talking about this. So someone sent in pictures of their raised beds and they have these soaker hoses running through there. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, what is the best way to water the raised bed? Because the space, as you can see, um, between the two hoses is the water isn't reaching those. Um, so Larry gave us an answer to that. If you want to talk about this, Larry. As you can see from the bed. Hold on, uh, real, real quick. I'm sorry there before the message disappears from the chat box. Uh, Barbara Doyle's wanted to know, does that apply to watering your garden? I think she means, uh, and Barbara, did you want to unmute? Do you mean in reference to not watering in the evening? Yeah, yes, I meant in reference to not watering in the evening. Yeah, it applies to everything. Yeah. Same applies. Yeah. And right. the garden, you, you don't want fungus on your, on your plants or your shrubs. Okay. Is that why I'm sorry, just... sorry about that, Larry? All right, thanks. See, the water will just sit on the leaves at night. If you're watering at night and it doesn't evaporate, that water is just going to sit there all night long. And the air temperature goes down somewhat, and it, it just is a perfect situation for fungus to form. Yep. So you better do it in the morning, and then the sun will evaporate a certain amount of it, but your plants will also get a good drink. Thank you. That will see them through the day. You're welcome. All right, back to Larry. Okay, so the, the benefit of, of those watching, the, this um, individual, she sent us in, uh, I think, three or four good pictures like this. Yeah. And just to give you a sense of size, this is an eight foot by four foot by two feet deep, uh, one of several yeah, raised, uh, raised beds. beds. Yeah. So as you can see, she's got a 25, it is a 25 foot soaker hose. Soaker hoses work fine unless you have really high water pressure. You know, I've had experience with them mm -hmm. with that and they'll eventually blow. They yeah. just can't handle the pressure. So if you can control your pressure, that's great. Uh, but if you can't, you, uh, you may have to come up with another uh, approach. So what we have here is it looks like she's got two rows of, and there may be some seeds in the middle. So she's taken that 25 feet and snaked it to get three eight foot pieces. The trouble mm -hmm. is the water, cannot, the water can't go sideways because this is a soaker hose, not a spraying hose, not like the one the kids run through in the summer out in the lawn. Yeah, um, so it'll only go so far. And, it, and if you keep it on, in this case, she said she left it on for this picture is after 90 minutes of watering. Well, most of that water is now straight down underneath the darkened 
um, soil area. So yes. one of my concerns is if that 90 minutes is pretty, that's, that's quite a bit of watering for any amount of space. So if that if the bottom of this um, raised bed is made out of wood, you could eventually be rotting that out pretty quickly because it's just going to sit down there on that wood um, and, and start to eat away at it. So the suggestion was double this up, put another 25 foot, you can hook them in, in series, put another 25 foot in there. Now you can add, you could actually add a couple of more rows depending on the type of, of plants that you're growing here and you'll get 90 to 100% uh, watering and you'll be able to do it in 20 minutes. Not only that, but the roots of these plants are going to spread out anyway. And right. left like they are now, they're going to go into dry soil. Right. So what you're saying is a good idea. Okay, um, the next slide I have, this is just, somebody said that um, they just wanted to know everything about watering, kind of a watering <laughs> 101 basic course. So they wanted to know when to water, how much to water, um, how to tell when you need to water, which I don't think we've really covered that, and how to tell when you've watered too much. So if you guys want to um, talk about this a little bit. When you water in the morning, mm -hmm. you water until your soil is moist. <laughs> if it's in the ground, you need to go at least an inch down. And if it's in a pot, you need to water until the water is running out the bottom of the pot. Not running, but dripping. And if you need to water, if you put your finger in the pot down the side and wiggle it around, if it's really, really dry, you need to water. The same in the, in the soil, in the ground. And if the water is pouring out the bottom and sitting in a saucer, then you've probably watered too much. And um, Carla, are you back on here? Because I know you had, you had something to say. I think you're muted. You had something to say about uh, uh, new plants versus established plants and also about shrubs and trees um, watering. If you wanna talk about that a minute. We need to unmute you though. Here, let me see if I can get you unmuted. Hmm. You might need to unmute yourself. I'm not sure. I'm trying. There you are. There you are. There you are. Oh, good. <laughs> we can see you again. Hey. <laughs> I hate computers. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, so what what was the question again? What, um, you had said some things about um, the differences between watering new plants and established plants, and you also talked about um, watering, how much you should water shrubs and trees. So that's something right. we haven't talked about yet. If you've plant, just planted a shrub or a tree, or a perennial also actually, uh, pretty much any plant, but especially for the shrubs and trees, you need to water fairly regularly. If it's been raining, you can get away without it, but you know, like if it rains maybe once a week or so, but if it's gone two weeks, you're probably going to need to water that. And you're going to want to do that for the first year, sometimes the second year, especially like with a, a tree. Uh, you're going to want to water it regularly, make sure that uh, it's getting water on a regular basis for that first couple years. After that, they are usually pretty much established and uh, you can get away with not having to water it unless it's been quite a while since it's rained. Uh, like if you're in a, a drought where we've uh, had no water for three weeks, you're definitely going to want to water, especially if it's really hot. Um, you want to water the ground, you don't want to water the leaves. When you water leaves, first off, it's going to probably encourage fungal diseases. <laughs> but uh, you're wasting your water on the leaves. You, you want to water the ground. Um, let's see. There's I would say one, that if- so There's you, another question. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. If, you're, if, you're, if, if you've got a container, uh, if it dries out too much, you may actually need to soak it in a bucket of water or something till it 
you know, the whole thing rehydrates, but you don't want to leave it sitting in that water after it's, you know, the whole plant is moist again. Um, Cause then if you, if you leave the, the plant sitting in water, you're going to lead to root rot. And a lot of times it, it's kind of hard to tell whether you need water or you've watered too much because the plant will wilt both ways. Yeah. But they do, t when you've watered too much and you've got root rot, they tend to turn brown and nothing helps. And by then you just throw out the plant because it's pretty much a loss. Well, I mm -hmm. tried to come up a, a second ago. Right, um, that kind of leads into the next question. There was a question that asked, is there any way to tell from the plant if it's being overwatered? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to mention. Yeah, they'll, they'll start to droop. They'll start to turn brown. Leaves will go yellow. Yeah. With, with, with most plants. Yeah. yeah. House plants too. There, there are a couple that, that uh, yellow means you, you watered, you haven't watered enough. But As you plant, they say plants die for two reasons, one of two reasons. Either it's had too much water or not enough. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's basically true. And either way, the leaves will go yellow. So it's up to you to decide which one you've done wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> if, the, if the soil is totally soggy, way too much water. <laughs> yeah. The best thing you can do to save it then is repot it in fresh soil. Right. Which, which brings up a point, Carla. Uh, this time of the year, a lot of people are... Um, doing transplantings, they're, they're moving something that's, they've gotten a lot of, I know we're, we're doing this, to another part of, the, of their property or giving it away. Mm -hmm. And plants or, or new plants that they bought and they want to put in the ground, especially if you're getting like a tree, that tree's going to need uh, regular watering for at least the first year, depending on how, how big you dug your hole, what kind of soil you've got and mm -hmm. prepared that, that uh, the space. Right. Um, but the transplantings, the, um, the golden rock that, that uh, Carl was kind enough to, uh, to share with us the other day, I'm watering that stuff almost every day to make yep. sure it's watered in because it just, it, you've disturbed the roots. It's the, the plant is in stress for a period of time and the water helps it get through that. Mm -hmm. Transplant shock. Yep, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well, we're about halfway done here almost, so we're going to just open it up. And uh, Megan, do we have any other questions in the chat box to, uh, to uh, get yeah, to? Yeah, it's, uh, it's perfect timing. Perfect right. timing. Um, Annette, she had a question. Um, she said, I have hydrangeas, and the new blooms grow on dead wood. When should I cut back? That depends on the type of hydrangea you've got. Yeah. Some, of them, some of them are... are um uh trim repeat bloomers flowers die off yeah like macrophilia macrophilia the um but the the um uh, the, the lace cap ones. lace cap ones you want to leave that on and you're not going to trim it until the next spring when you see which which uh branches have got growth on them now the macrophylla only blooms on old wood yes yeah. Yep. It will bloom on last year. Last year's new growth is what will bloom this year. So if you prune your hydrangea in the fall, which some people do to tidy it up, or then you're cutting, yeah. The, yeah, then they're cutting off all the possibility of bloom the following summer. Yeah, so all you want to do is take the flowers off, not the, not the branches. If you're not sure, just leave it alone until it puts new growth yeah. out. Right. Now, if you have one of the newer hybrids, like uh, Endless Summer or one of them, they'll bloom on both old wood and new wood, yeah. and so you've got a better chance of something blooming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if you're not sure, question. you better just leave them alone until the new growth comes out, and then cut off anything that's dead above the new growth. Yep. The blooms make nice dry arrangements. They do. <laughs> Do we have more questions, Megan? Can I just make a comment about the neem oil? If um, if you're spraying for, if you're spraying as an insecticide, if you have scale on a shrub and you want to spray it, don't spray it when the wind's blowing 
and number one and number two don't spray it in sun because it's like it'd be like a frying pan for your for mm. your plants right you know oil and heat yeah, that kind of goes for most uh most insecticides that you're going to use are those two same uh principles yeah. do apply not when it's um windy or when it's too bright out. Um, so there was another question. Um, it came from Barbara and she said, are mushrooms that grow in your plants and or vegetable gardens good or bad? I guess un, un uh, plant That's fungi. mushroom, she means, un, not spores that she put in. No, it's fungi. Yeah. It's, it's fungus. Yeah, I don't think it's, it's not going to hurt them. Pick them off if you don't like the looks of them. It usually comes from the mulch. Right. It's, <laughs> yeah. The fungus is right. in the soil and it's uh, trying to work on degrading mm -hmm. the, uh, the wood or any uh, um, organic material that's in there. And Perfect. Thank you. You should Carla? Never eat them What's that? <laughs> What's that, Megan? Right. Never eat them unless you have them. I said good. That was exactly what I would have said, uh, Carla. Um, uh, what would you say, Debbie? Sorry. I said never eat them unless you uh, absolutely know that they are the type that are edible because a lot of them are poison. Oh, they can be so poisonous. Correct. Don't, don't eat them unless you buy them. Correct. <laughs> Sometimes even experts um, so have the, a hard the last time question, with that. Exactly. Uh, the last question actually is kind of directed towards you, Debbie. Um, so Karen said she attended the sweet potato starter class and she kept her sweet potato in a mason jar until it sprouted and okay. she cut the sprouts and put them in small containers for slips. Mm -hmm. Most of the leaves are green, but when some of them started to turn brown, she determined that it was dead and not worth worth putting in raised bed. Should she just start over with a new sweet potato or is it too late to grow sweet potatoes? Um, the the, the um, sweet potatoes slips that she, she should have twisted them off and put them in water. Is that what she did? Is she here? Okay, I'm muted. Yes, I'm, I'm still here. Okay. I think I I had some that was in the water. I wasn't sure what to do with it. Some of them were in water and the others I had put in the, um, in like dirt, like, like you do the slips. Okay. Did they, have, did they have roots on them when you put them in yeah. the dirt? Yeah. They, and did they, did they, when did you plant them in the dirt? Um, that would have been April, like the end of April. Yeah, they, um, the, the problem with planting them, and I had this problem too, because I had some that I ordered online because I, I didn't have, I wanted some white sweet potatoes and I didn't have any slips of those. Um, and I ordered them from a company online and they said they would ship them at the appropriate date for planting. Well, they shipped them on April 21st. And that's really, really too early to plant sweet potatoes. Um, I had to plant them. Um, because I had nothing else I could do to keep them alive. So I planted them and I put a row cover over them to protect them. And I just kind of, you know, kept my fingers crossed. And actually I lost about half a dozen of them just because it was too cold. Um, so that might have been what happened to yours. It might have gotten too cold. Uh, the ones that survived have actually just this week taken off. Um, but as far as starting new ones, it's a little late. It really takes quite a while um, for the for the sprouts to start. That's why I usually start mine like um, you know February or March, and then it takes till this time for them to get ready. And I actually, it's not too late to plant them now. It's actually a pretty good time. I have one um, that I'm going to twist off and root. It only takes a couple days for them to root, and I'm going to plant it in the space where one of the ones I had died um, and stick it back in there. The um, ones that I left in the water, can I take, is that what you're saying? The ones that I left in the, can I take that and twist it off and, um, and plant, and you plant can take that? Them, you can, you can take them and twist them off and put them in water and let them grow roots, a little bit of roots first before you put them in the ground. And oh. they, they should take, they should take off in the heat. They love hot weather. Um, yeah. So just make sure you keep them watered like we talked about and, um, 
and they'll, they'll, they should be fine. It's not too late to plant them. They need about 90 days, 90 mm -hmm. to 120 days of um, growing time. So you can have, so that's like three months. So June, July, August, September. I don't usually harvest mine till October. So you still have plenty of time. Oh, okay. Well, this is sweet potatoes to eat, not to use as ornamentals. Yes. Okay. Yeah, my class was about eating sweet potatoes. Okay. <laughs> I grow the <laughs> ornamental ones. And just so you know, the, no, the we picture did have, that I had put there was the picture of the one I put in the, I don't have a picture of the one that is in the water. That was just the one I put in there. Okay. Um, so we had one more question come in the chat box. Uh, can we put the unplanted mushrooms in the compost? Now, uh, we were talking about mushrooms that we didn't know the identification of um, previously, but uh, mushrooms like the mushroom caps that you eat, you know that you know what they are certainly they can go in the compost pile uh wendy what's your thoughts on putting the the other uh, mushrooms in the compost pile what the the fungus ones that come from the compost uh, come from the, right no i wouldn't put those in the compost pile but if you have mushrooms left over that you bought you can put them in your compost and they will actually produce mushrooms surprisingly and you i i had some I had some potato toppings, you know, peelings when I threw in the compost, and I actually have potatoes growing. I've got these beautiful plants coming out of the wire. <laughs> I don't know if I'll harvest them or not, but they're way down in the compost. And I had mushrooms growing in there too. It's quite funny. It's like a vegetable garden all on its own. <laughs> yeah, you can, you, you can throw them in. Now, the ones that are truly fungi, poisonous fungi, I would not put those on your compost because that's encouraging them to grow even more. And then you'll be, when you put that compost on your garden, you're then reintroducing the spores into your garden and that could cause a lot of problems. So I, no, I wouldn't put them in the compost. Are there okay. any questions, Megan? She's muted. Oh. Uh, no, no other questions at this time. Okay, well, we'll have another uh, chance at the end to ask more questions also. Oh, I, well, I had a question okay. um, for Wendy. Yes. Uh, you were talking about tickling the roots of plants when you take them out of a container. Yes. Um, I didn't do that with any of my tomatoes, and I bought three at an organic nursery, mm -hmm. and, um, and two were Bonnie plants that I bought at Home Depot. Um, the two Bonnies are doing absolutely fabulous <laughs> uh, and, and growing like crazy. And I didn't do, I didn't tickle any of them. And the three that I got at the organic nursery are just about all died on me. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, at first I thought it was the watering um, that they weren't getting enough water, and it might be that, but I'm wondering if it was because I didn't tickle the roots, or uh, maybe because they're not getting enough water, or maybe it's a combination. Um, well, do you, do you remember when you took them out of the pot, were they very root-bound? Did they seem to be pot-bound? Oh, yeah, they were pot-bound. So that, that could make a difference, then, if you tickle the roots, because those roots will continue to go around in the circle the size of the pot. So they won't expand out beyond that. But, but the bonnie ones were that way too, and they're growing like crazy. They might be a stronger plant. You know, I can't explain that really, but they might be a stronger plant than the organic ones. Claire, did you plant them deeply? Because tomatoes, you can plant them, you know, about as much as yeah. like two thirds or so below the level of the soil, and that helps them grow new roots. Gives them oh. a good no, I planted them right at the pot height. Yeah. Put them deeper. They need to be deeper than that. Oh, is yeah. that right? Oh, yes. They, they form roots all along the stem when they're planted. And it gives them a really good root system, which yep. is a good anchor for the plant as it gets tall. And you can strip off the, uh, the lower leaves and just leave uh, like a, a tuft up at the top. 
just plant the thing all the way down and they'll they'll sprout all along you get a, a much stronger plant that way yeah oh, wow only tomatoes you do that for they're different from everything else yeah. <laughs> marigolds <laughs> so i i grow my marigolds from seeds so they do what they do <laughs> Oh, well, that's very good information. Uh, it looks like I'm going to have to buy them all over again. And, and I can't get that again, the Amish paste and, it, you know, that type of plant and the early girls are all sold out around here. So, hmm. oh, well, <laughs> you can't, did you say the three organic ones had died or they're just not doing well? The early girl has died and the Amish paste is not doing well at all. Um, the Amish paste is just, is about half dead. Hmm. But at the, the early girl just went out, fell over on the ground and won't get up. Huh. Oh no. Did you have cut worms? Uh, no, no, no. It, it, it's brown at the bottom of the stem and uh, it's just, it's brown and, you know, on the bottom of, it's, it got brown on the bottom of the stem first. Um, the rest of the stem is green, but the, and the, the leaves were green, but the, uh, the stem is brown at the bottom. What does that mean? Was your, was your soil very, very wet? No, the, the soil, I mean, it rained, it poured and poured here. And I'm in Wilmington. Um, and then it was dry only a couple of days and we've had beautiful weather. And then I, um, I went out and watered yesterday and, and it was, I guess, too late already uh, for it. Mm. it um, stem sounds like uh, some kind of a fungus has already taken over the stem. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? If it went brown at the bottom. Yeah. You might want to just dig it up and take a look at the root structure and see whether it's uh, still viable. Hey, you can't, if the roots look good, if you yeah. want to replant it as some fresh soil, it might just come back and grow a new, new top. Worth a try. You mean plant it deeper and see, I mean, it, <clears throat> plant it below the place where it's brown? No. No, you have, where it's brown, you have to cut that piece off. That's at the bottom, right? Yeah. It's at the bottom, but the whole root stock is under it. Yeah, well, it's the... If the root stock's good, you can replant it in new soil, and it yeah, might just, look at it. might just regrow. That's interesting. I suppose. As we say, <laughs> nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you lose it entirely. <laughs> I heard you could propagate tomatoes from cuttings. I've never tried that, but has anybody ever tried that? You know, I've grown them from my own seed. Mm -hmm. No, but I had, um, this year, I had, um, I think I actually broke it. I broke the entire, all the leaves off the top of one of my cherry tomato plants. Mm -hmm. And I decided to leave the stem there, and it regrew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's got a good root system. Yeah, it grew into a plant. Yeah. So, Claire, I have, you said, I have four yellow pear tomato plants and you're welcome to them if you want them <laughs> <laughs> but where do you live i live in Smyrna. oh well i'm up in north wilmington so that's quite a drive but that's very sweet <laughs> <laughs> well if you decide you want them we can meet somewhere in the middle okay all right i'll ask debbie how to find you <laughs> I have a suggestion. What's that? When you plant your tomato plants, lay the plants down. In other words, take take the leaves off from the from the roots up to where you up to maybe two or two or three um, levels before you go to the top, and just lay the whole plant that lay the the the, the, the mm -hmm. uh, stem down on the ground and cover the stem up and leave mm -hmm. and just push up the your your leaf part and you'll get roots all along that and you won't have to go deep down to put it down you just lay the, lay the root lay the plant down flat on the ground push up the leaf part and cover it over with 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 soil they will grow like crazy right it's called trenching yeah a lot of gardeners do that you grow again you're saying put it on top of the ground and not dig a hole 
dig well, a trench. You don't have to go very deep. Dig, dig a, put your put your put your put your roots in the in the ground, and then lay put put your plant down flat on the ground. Dig a trench along there, and then cover cover the the stem up, and you just have the the the, uh, the leaves showing at the top. Okay. Got a trench there. Okay. And le and let the let the leaves sit on the ground. Basically. No, the, the the leaves will point up. You just push the stem up so that the leaves are standing up. Yeah, as it grows, it'll be sideways, and as it grows, it'll turn and go up towards the sun. So yeah, you're you're going to plant it shallowly, but on its side, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And you find that works well. Oh yes, ma'am. <laughs> Roots grow all around the stem, off the stem. Wow. And, and do you tickle, do you tickle your roots first? Do you tickle the roots first off of the plant? No, I just it, 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 I don't know how big a pot you bought your 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 tomato plant. Little four four inch. Oh, okay. You just stick the whole stick the four inch pot in the ground and lean it so that you can lay the the, the stem on the ground and dig a little trench and put put the soil over top of the the, the stem and leave the top of the leaves up above the ground and just water it and let it go. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a new one. Thank you. <laughs> we, um, yeah, Art, Art was a master gardener um, for years and years. So it's good to see you, Art. Um, <laughs> the next question in the... Uh, so the next question is uh, uh, um, in the chat box. We'll go ahead and ask this right quick. Uh, my jasmine plant got full of white bugs in the winter, so I removed all the leaves and changed the soil and fertilized it. What can I do to help my plant still grow well? What kind of jasmine is this? Is it spring blooming, summer blooming, or winter blooming? Does anyone know? Megan, you're muted. Uh, Rashmi, do you, do you know what type of jasmine you have? When does it bloom? What Maybe color? Maybe they must have left. Oh, they said summer blooming. Blooming, she says. Was summer. Summer. Yeah. Is it yellow or pink? We don't know. She hasn't answered yet. No. The white white bugs, did she say? Yes. Tiny? Indian white version. Indian white version. Oh, oh, the white version. Um, now I'm not familiar with the white one. I've got the winter, the summer, and the, the I've got the yellow and the pink. I haven't got a white jasmine. Uh, uh, I got a white one. Hi, Art. It's good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a long time. <laughs> oh, it has, dear. It has. <laughs> you still making your cement things? Yes, ma'am. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time, though. It's good to see you. Um, on this jasmine, um, I would spray it with neem oil. I, I'm a great believer in neem oil if it's got bugs on it. That'll take care of them. Has that lady gone with that question? I'm, I'm not sure, uh, but Karen had a question about the trenching. Um, she said, does that work for any other plants? And I said, no, that's just for tomatoes because you can plant them so deeply. Yeah, yeah they root all along the stem. All right, a... Debbie, do you want to go ahead and move on to the next uh, set of questions? Sure, I can do that. Um, so this is actually a question. I think, Barbara, you submitted this quite a while ago. Um, and uh, I think you had gotten your answer, but I thought it was an excellent question. So I thought we'd go ahead and put it out here for other people. Um, she had a tomato, splot with some, a tomato plant with some spots on the leaves, and <clears> she wanted to know what it was, and it wasn't bugs. Um, so... This was just a 
educated guess since we can't actually take this plant to a lab and look at it under a microscope and do tests on it. Um, so uh, our, we actually asked Verna and Karen, our, our tomato people that had done the tomato presentation, this question, and uh, they came up with the conclusion that it could possibly be a septic leaf spot. Um, so if anybody else can look at this picture and come up with any p other possible um, answers for Barbara. Well, the only one I, I came up with it could possibly be tobacco virus. If they're a smoker and they've been handling tomato plants, they can pass tobacco virus onto their tomato plants. No. A lot of people don't know that. Not a smoker. Then it's not tobacco virus. <laughs> More than likely the septoria leaf spot. And uh, what, what do you do about it? You just what do you say, Art? You grow vegetables. Uh, don't, haven't had that problem, don't know. Can't give an answer to that. Now is this septoria leaf spot a fungus or is it a bacterial? It's a fungus. Um, you, you see, you should be able to use the neem oil on that right. too. Is this a I fungicide? Say, it's an herbicide. I use neem oil all the time. I add a little soap to it also. A little, it, yeah. you got, you, you use neem oil. <laughs> add a little, add a little uh, I use what's called Dr. Bronner's soap. It's a concentrate. That's, that's what I use. But uh, you know, I, any detergent, a couple of drops in there will help the neem oil so that it doesn't burn like we were talking, you were talking about earlier. It, it, it I think Murphy's oil is really good to mix yeah. with it because it's a pure soap. It doesn't have any phosphates or anything else in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. yeah. And it helps the oil stick to the plant so it doesn't just run off. Right. What? What's it called, Dr. Bronner? Dr. Bronner's. Bronner. Yeah. Bronner. And I just use um, the like natural plant-based dishwashing liquid. Um, a few drops of like the the Myers or the um, you know the um, we'll see. the natural things that don't have any chemicals in them. They're just totally plant-based. I use that yeah. in my neem oil. That's why Murphy's oil soap is good mm -hmm. because that's a natural soap. Yes. Another you one. can use that just as an insecticide too. It makes What's, good insecticide. Oh, Murphy, Murphy so, yeah. <coughs> Which is the soap the soap they use for furniture. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, well, we'll go on to the next question. Um, someone submitted this question that they had uh, black spots on their clematis and they wanted to know what they could do about it. Um, I believe. Uh, Leslie, you were the one who uh, answered this one for us. Yeah, this is what we decided was uh, clematis um, wilt, uh, which is a, a fungal growth. Unfortunately, it's not, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Uh, you can use some uh, spray fungicides early in the season that would maybe prevent it from starting, but uh, there are no real chemical treatments after the fact. What you would have to do is uh, take it off. Uh, the, any any leaves that have the spots, don't put them in your compost, but get get rid of them. Uh, you may want to consider moving the plant if, to where it can get more sun to avoid um, the the fungus to start with. Make sure you're watering around near the roots rather than on the on the leaves themselves. Like a lot of fungus things that we've talked about, the, yeah. the, the uh, more the closer to the soil you get when you're watering, the better off you are. Um, I have read someplace that, um, again, with clematis, if you have it growing up against a wall and it, and it, it develops this wilt, that you would, should, as we said, move, remove all the, the um, uh, affected parts, but you also could, should consider spraying the, uh, the wall itself with a disinfect, disinfectant uh, mm -hmm. to prevent it from re, 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 uh, uh, applying to any plants that are left in the same site. Isn't it can be pretty nasty stuff. All funguses are. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's sort of my definition. Good point. I mean, prune, pr prune where you can, but uh, you may not be able to save the plant. Okay. And be aware that if you dig up a clematis, their roots are enormous. I mean, they spread a long way. 
far reaching. Yeah, yeah. The, then the vines yeah. themselves can get pretty carried away too. Beautiful yeah. flowers, but they, they can take a lot of space. But they don't, they like sun on the leaves, but they don't like sun on their roots. So yeah. the way the roots call is to find a flat stone and put right up against the, where the growth comes out. So it stops the sun from really heating the root area. And that yeah. will help keep, keep them better. And keep, yeah, keep the fungus out. Yes. That's about all we can say about that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the next question, I believe this was yours, Wendy. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce that. So, <laughs> so you can uh, talk about this one. Yeah, she said, well, this was a friend of mine, actually, and she called me and she said, my chemisipris is turning brown right in the middle and the needles are falling off. What can I do? And I said, well, you can cut it down and put a new plant in. <laughs> but I said, it's probably a fungus. It's probably a Phomopsis fungus. And if you spray it every month for four months, you know, give it a good spray with the neem oil at, as it needs and, uh, and then prune and destroy the disease parts out. And it does come back, but it, I mean, it depends how big an area has been destroyed. If it's still half of the tree already gone, then you might just be better just to cut it down and put another one up somewhere else. Don't put it in the same place because the fungus could be in the soil. If any of those needles drop down to the soil, which they will if they're falling off, then that fungus is then on the ground. So anything you plant in that same area, if it's in the same family, it could also end up with the same fungus. So that wouldn't be wise, but when you when you assess the case of the plant being too the plants being too close together, so insufficient. Uh, air, 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 this air. was just a single shrub all okay. by itself. Okay. It was in the middle of a bed, and so there was nothing around it that was really preventing it from getting the sun or the the okay. air, and it, it just got the fungus on it. And wow. I think I think she's been watering it, you know, overhead. And mm. yeah. the needles got wet, and it, and then it got damp, and just got this fungus on it. But she also used an awful lot of mulch that she buys in, and I'm not a great fan of mulch because it holds so many different fungus fungi in it. Yeah. You know, and you see them in the fall when you start to get that in between weather when it's very damp in the mornings, you get heavy dews, and where you've got all this mulch, you get these weird-looking fungus that come up. You know, they, some of them, they, they really look like dead fingers coming out of the ground there sometimes. They're quite horrible. <laughs> and I don't want those in my ground. I, I just stay with compost that I make rather than using, I don't like to use um, mulch. That's just me. Mm. Okay, the next question um, was about roses. Um, I know, Wendy, you had um, submitted this one too. Um, about leaves that are turning brown and blotchy and curling. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think that was a fungus too. Well, I, th I think it was rose rust that caused them. They, they curl up from the sides. And <coughs> it's not black spot. It's nothing like black spot. It just gradually sort of creeps into the into the leaf and and it starts to curl up and go brown. And I think that's what it is. So if she uses a rose fungicide. Or she could use neem oil and use it every day for seven days, as long as she has symptoms on the roses. And make sure she doesn't spray overhead, you know, when she's watering. Make sure you spray around the roots, not over the flower, over the leaves. Because most funguses are spread when you get rain or you water from overhead. And if there's a fungus on the top leaves and it rains on it, then that drops down, you know, and takes the fungus with it through all the other layers of the plant. Mm -hmm. and it spreads it. Yeah, so. I don't have any roses, but I know there's a lot of um, rose problems going around because on the helpline, we've had people um, calling in with questions about the rose rosette disease. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody knows anything about that or wants to talk about that at all. No, I don't know anything about that. Rose rosette, uh, you'll see the... Uh, new growth coming out very distorted. It just looks really <laughs> weird. And unfortunately, there is at this point, I don't think there's any cure for it. Um, they mm. usually recommend just right. you know, pulling it and throwing it out. Mm. Yeah. 
Must be yeah, they, they um, so sometimes it'll come out and, and they'll call it witch's broom. So towards the top of your plant, when the new growth starts to grow, it'll be a reddish color and it kind of forms in the way of a witch's broom. And, you know, you can try to cut that out, but eventually that is going to be what takes your, your plant. Um, they are working on some, you know, res uh, resistant varieties. Uh, the good thing is multiflora rose also gets the rose rosette disease and it's an invasive plant. So maybe that'll be what can get yeah. that under control. Probably where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could try, cutting, you could try cutting the rose right down to about six inches and just see if it does yeah. come back without it, without the disease. It might. It's worth a try. Okay, um, let's go on to question 14. Um, someone has plants that get powdery mildew um, and they want it to prevent this. So, Wendy, I believe this was your answer. Um, yeah. We'll let you talk about it and see if anybody else has some other ideas. Well, um, yeah, if, you, if, if it's already got powdery mildew, it's no good using the milk. The milk and water only works if you put it on before you get the powdery mildew. So if you've got certain plants that you know get it every year, like bee balm, monoda, that gets powdery mildew. Phlox, that very often will have powdery mildew. If you spray them with two, one pot milk, two pots of water, it will prevent them from getting powdery mildew. And they look so much better without the mildew. But it's not, some people have asked me, do I use 1% uh, or full fat milk? <laughs> and it doesn't really matter what kind of milk you use. It's the protein, not the fat content that's important. <laughs> I understand that the, uh, that spray with milk will also help prevent black spot on roses. Yes, it will, it will. But if you already have powdery mildew, then you spray with fungicide like neem oil. This, it's just the, you know, the do all everything, neem oil. Yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, this was a question, question that actually we just got in this morning. Um, this That's person, Yeah, this person sent in three pictures. Um, the other two pictures pretty much look dead. So uh, <laughs> I put this picture out here. Um, so this is a trillium plant. Um, and she had thought that possibly it wasn't just wasn't out yet. But um, now, that looks like a bacterial. Yeah, yeah uh, that's problem. been out and it's got it looks more like anthracnose, doesn't it? Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, she could try spraying with it. But if it's bacterial, that means that, that even the neem oil may not help that. I don't know. Do we know how long those plants have been there? She didn't, she didn't say it in the email, but I saw uh, Deb. Well, my trilliums look really, really good right now. They're, they're tall, they're strong, and they're really green, and they look really healthy. No. But, Is the person who submitted this question here now? I don't, no. I don't remember the name this, of the person. Wendy, one of the, some of the reading I was doing on, on trilliums uh, earlier today, mm -hmm. like they be transplanted, was, uh, was one notable. They don't like to be transplanted. I right. understand that a it's good illegal. time to transplant them, strangely enough, is when they are in full bloom. Yeah. It'll, but it's, it's actually illegal in Delaware to transplant them unless they're pri growing in a private ground, hmm. private property. Right. Well, that's what I was wondering. If, if yeah, you can't protected. dig them up from the wild. No, they're like they're like the lady slipper orchid. It's illegal to dig yeah. on. Yeah, you have to get a permit if you're on. Right. Properties. If, if, if they're on private property, you can do what you want with them. But right. Not but, but if you're up at you know, like in the public lands, the you know, forest, public lands, yeah. But yes. the the trillium, a lot of the plant is under under the soil. Yes. More of the plants under the soil that. And it takes up to five years for them to uh, establish in a spot. It takes up to five years before they'll bloom. Yeah, it does. So I'm, I'm wondering how long these plants have been there, if, yeah. that's, if that's a causal factor here. Well, it's a fairly large leaf. Yeah. I don't know, but it's definitely not healthy. No. Yeah. Larry, why is it illegal to dig them up? To protect native. It's a protective, it's a protected uh, it's like endangered or pretty much 
Mm. Well, they're, they're not very easy to grow and you don't see them very often. So but, they've, be, they've become one of those protected plants. Yeah. They don't they're want down on uh, you digging anything up from the wild. I mean, even going down a street or a road, you know, a country road, and you see a plant you like, you're not supposed to dig it up. <laughs> okay. I've never done that. I just was curious. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't want this to become extinct. You don't see right. them very often. No. I, I, I've never heard of it myself, but. But they're tender, uh, uh, ephemeral. And they like deep shade. Most deep of shade, yeah, wooded, wooded areas. Wooded areas for the most part. You know, oh, okay. Very early, very early bloomers, and they're, if you can even get them, they're quite expensive. Yeah. And they're, they're a bit fragile. If you step on them, you can kill them. If you yeah. pick the flower off, you can kill them. <laughs> There's a hundred ways to kill a trillium, I think. <laughs> You only need one. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question, I believe, Wendy, this was one you had too about keeping yes, squirrels out of the bird feeder. Yeah, I love, I love to keep this squirrels one. out of the bird feeder. Add red pepper to the bird food because they, uh, squirrels are mammals, so they react the same way we do to red pepper. So if the red pepper you have burns your tongue, it's going to burn their tongue. And they don't like it. Also, so. use a baffle and move the bird feeder away from your trees. A, a squirrel can jump something like 10 feet, from what oh, I yeah. understand. Oh, yes, they can. And uh, so, you know, first off, a lot of the shepherd's crooks that they sell are not tall enough. You really need a tall pole. For your bird feeder and you put a uh, a baffle, baffle on the strip. probably six at least six feet up if you can that doesn't stop them <laughs> so far i've had good luck with it yeah. i mean it might deter them for a short while but they eventually find a way around it yeah squirrels are uh, their motto is if there's a will there's a way yeah that's true and the red peppers, I mean, I'm sorry, just for everybody, the red pepper doesn't affect the birds at all. No, no because they're not mammals, so I mean, right. they quite happily eat it. Then it doesn't bother them. It's only mammals that it bothers. So that's the easiest way is to put red pepper in your fruit and your bird food. But of course, there are many other ways to. You can use a slinky if you're using a shepherd's hook. If you can attach a slinky to it underneath your feeder. You can really have some fun watching the squirrels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty effective also. Yeah. Well, I got my husband one of those um, bird feeders, hold five pounds of food. He's not very keen on that because he said it costs so much to fill it. But it has a rechargeable battery in the bottom. And when this, it's got a, a ring around the bottom of the feeder. And when the squirrels grab hold of it, it goes round very fast and so oh, flings them off. And it throws them off. They yeah. hang on for dear life, and they're going round so fast, and they finally fall off. But they come right back again to do it all over again. It's quite funny. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> they go flying off into the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't stop them. Um, red pepper's the easiest way. Our, our final question was also about uh, bird Good. feeders. So yes. uh, starlings um, eating up all of the bird food. Yeah, they do. They'll go, you know, you get a crowd of those starlings come down and they'll go through your bird feeder in no time flat. That's true. <laughs> yeah, well, we, had, we had a cedar deck and it was beginning to go in places. So we had it taken out and a new deck put in and we had all this cedar left and we didn't know what to do with it so a carpenter says well, why not make you a bird stand so he constructed this almost oriental looking bird stand and all the bird feeders go up underneath it and we did that to keep the bird food dry and and we found that when the starlings came down they wouldn't go up on the feeders because starlings t i checked out why they wouldn't go under starlings take off vertically and if they have to go underneath a, a cover of some kind, they get scared. They won't, they won't go underneath because they can't take off vertically. They hit the roof. So it keeps them out of your feeders. It's really good. It's really safe. It does a lot of bird food. 
That's a great fact, Todd. I never knew that. Does that is that also apply to blackbirds? Do you know, Wendy? Yeah, they are the blackbirds and the grackles and the blackbirds. Yes. Okay, so yeah, because we had a real oh, we real run with those Probably. guys in the spring. Yeah. yeah. No, we, well, not only do we like it because it keeps the food, the feed dry. I mean, it doesn't get snow on it. It doesn't get rain on it. So it yeah. saves you a lot of bird food. But the birds like it. They love to get underneath there. Sure. Yeah. And it looks good, too. It looks nice having all these bird feeders in one place. Bird baths. It keeps the blackbirds and the grackles out. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, with that, that was actually um, the end of our pre-submitted questions. So now we, uh, Megan, um, if you want to open it up to any other questions that anyone wants to put into the chat box. Yep, or you can unmute. Uh, we did not have any questions. Well, the questions that we did have were answered along the way. So um, if anyone has any questions and they'd like to unmute, please do so. I want to say thank you to the Master Gardeners that did uh, serve on this panel today. We really appreciate your time and expertise. You're very You're welcome. welcome. Debbie, would you like to... Sh thank um, you. Uh, Debbie, would you like to um, share the evaluation in the chat box? I will, but we're not quite done yet, Megan. <laughs> um, oh. Does anybody else um, have any more questions you'd like to submit before we uh, pull it all together here? Okay, um, I do want to let you know that anytime um, we have mentioned any names of uh, brand names in this presentation, it is just an option for you and it is not something that we are endorsing. Um, and also that we are a equal opportunity provider to everyone. Um, and Finally, I wanted to let you know before I give you that link for the evaluation, um, if you have further questions at any time, you can call the helpline number. We are currently manning this from our homes. So uh, what happens is you leave a message and um, the message will be emailed to the master gardener who is on the helpline that day. And we are only doing this now on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So uh, if you call and leave a message, um, someone should get back to you at the next um, master gardening time, which is 10 to one, or sometimes, you know, we're, we're not quite keeping to those exact hours right now, um, but we'll get back to you and try to help you the best we can um, without being able to actually look at your plants or your samples or send them in. So we basically just use our best judgment based on what you tell us or, if you do have pictures that you would like to send in, um, the best way to do that is to email them to our Kent County Master Gardeners email address that you see on the screen. Um, and also um, at any time, if you wanna find out what workshops we have uh, coming up, uh, this is the web address here, the website address of our new um, relatively new page on the Delaware State University website um, that will list our upcoming workshops and allow you to register for those from from this link. And Just another question. Okay. We did have another question um, okay. about uh, what is the ideal soil level for growing pole lima beans and um, I don't mind answering that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did a lot of research with lima beans in 2007 through 2009 when I was working um, part-time with Delta State. And uh, the appropriate amount of soil level is, is when you plant the lima bean, it's right above uh, the soil line. So you don't plant them too deep like a tomato. You plant them right at that soil level. Um, was there another question about the pole lima beans? I meant like calcium, um, the things that are oh. in the soil. Yeah, like pH. Okay. Like Leslie and Larry, like, do you know more right, about right. this? You can, as, as, a, as a general rule, your, your basic 10-10-10 fertilizer before you're planting is going to help most of the plants that we use. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. 
And I just want to let everybody know that um, if you look in the chat box, I have posted the link to our online evaluation there. Um, I will also send it to you by email in case you don't have time to do this right now. Um, if you do have time, I invite you to click on that link and go ahead and complete our short form. Um, this gives us a lot of information, a lot of helpful information for planning future workshops um, mm -hmm. for you. It tells us what days of the week you like to have your workshops on and what time and what kind of topics you're interested in. So this is really important to us to um, uh, in planning what you guys want in the future. So I'd um, like to encourage you to go ahead and do that now, or if you don't have time, uh, we'll send it to you um, by email, like I said, and you can do it at your leisure. Thank you all. You're welcome. Thank Have you. Fun. Happy gardening. Thank you. We hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Have a good one. It was, thank you all. I was very, oh, very you. interesting and helpful. Good. I'm good. glad. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, Barbara. Bye-bye. <laughs>